Welcome to the Fun Candles Complete Candle Making Course. In this course, we'll learn how to make candles from beginner to professional level. By the end of this course, you're about to make stunning pillar candles and container candle jars. Now, you don't need any previous candle making experience. This course is designed to be your first step to becoming a candle maker. We will start with some very basic candle tools and waxes and build our way up, step by step. Along the way, we will learn all the necessary skills that we need to make candles at a professional level. You could find the different sections of this course and the link to the tools and materials in the description below the video. Lastly, you don't need to worry about taking notes. I created a candle making reference guide that listed everything we have learned in this course. Are you ready? Let's get started. Hi, I'm Jade. Today we are going to have the first lesson of candles. I'll walk you through all of the candle making tools. For each tool, you'll get to know how to select it and its selection method. Let me start with heating appliances. They can be induction cookers or wax heaters that you may have at home. High powered appliances are no good for candle making. If the temperature rises too fast, some candles will not be heat resistant. The soy wax, for example, will turn yellow once its temperature rises above 100 degrees C. 212.0 degrees Fahrenheit. And overheated gel wax will emit smoke. Therefore, I recommend the low-powered appliances. Novices, in particular, can't control the wax temperature well. They'd better choose to work with low-powered appliances. The small heater like this one is ideal for novices. It's a 500-watt wax heater. Novices can also go with this as it takes some time to heat up. Set the wax heater to medium heat. Don't shift to the maximum heat. An alternative is a wax heater used to boil water or tea. It has two heat settings, i.e. high heat and low heat. It's usually set to low heat. This is an 800 watt wax heater. It beats the thermal efficiency of the 500 watt wax heater. Moreover, its heating area is larger. Suppose I'm about to give each cup of wax a different color. I can place several cups on the heater and warm them up concurrently. For the advanced students, this will help them to operate multiple colors and multiple candles at the same time. The last one is an induction cooker available in most households. This induction cooker also has room for numerous containers. But induction cookers heat up too fast. Don't use this 800 watt induction cooker at full capacity. You have to set it to low heat. I wouldn't recommend induction cookers to novices because they heat up too fast. If you haven't got time for operation, it's easy to overheat it when wax is melted. What's the big difference between an induction cooker and a wax heater? There's no lingering heat once you turn the induction cooker off. But if you switch off a wax heater, the heat will linger long enough to keep the wax warm. The wax heater is great, especially when you need time to color the wax cups respectively. In that case, leave the liquid wax on the heating plate, and the lingering heat will keep the wax warm for a while. I usually use this wax heater to make the candles. If any of you enjoy making short videos and need to go online, the white wax heater simply looks good on camera. What I just said would help you pick a good heater. The next tool is heat guns. This tool is indispensable for candle making. You can't go without it no matter what kind of candle you're making. Some heat guns are more powerful than others. I recommend low-powered heat guns to novices. It's safer despite the long heating time. Get a more powerful heat gun after you get the hang of the techniques. I'm more used to a high-powered heat gun because of its thermal efficiency. Heat guns are primarily used to treat the wax surface. For example, a heat gun can be used to melt the uneven wax surface. After blowing, the surface will be solidified again and then it will be smooth. You need a heat gun to change the state of the liquid wax. A heat gun is also useful when you're cleaning things up. Whenever the candle making session is over, you'll find wax residue on containers or on the tools. Under the circumstances, melt the wax residue with a heat gun and dry the surface with a tissue. The containers should be cleaned up as soon as the wax is poured into the molds. So, cleaning is also one of the most important functions of the heat gun in our candle making. Please note that when you're removing the wax residue, the heat gun shouldn't get too close to the inner surface of the PC molds, or else the heat will melt and deform the molds. Therefore, when you use a high-powered heat gun to clean up the PC molds, you should blow it from a distance, not too close. Or better still, 
try to use a low-powered heat gun and then wipe the PC molds clean. This is a choice of the heat gun. Look at my tabletop. There's a cutting mat to keep the table clean. The mat is also heatproof. It comes in a large A2 size. If your table is wooden, you'd better protect the table with such a heatproof cutting mat. If you can't scrape away all of the wax residue on the cutting mat, melt the wax with a heat gun and wipe it clean with a tissue. It's easy to clean up a cutting mat. Take a look at my table. It's a large marble table. I find a marble tile, round off its corners, and put it on my table. Now, I have more working space. I can easily clean the marble without damaging the table. Let your working space and working conditions dictate the best table for you. Now, take a look at thermometers, which are essential for candle making. The thermometers can be Debbie dead into three types. One is the red water filled thermometer like this one. It's the simplest type. The red water filled thermometer is also a probe thermometer. Dip the probe into the liquid wax and let the temperature go up. It'll take a while. You can't get the temperature readings instantly. When the red water stops expanding, you can read the temperature from the scale. But a red water filled thermometer has one drawback. It's easily broken because it's made of glass. If you don't stir the wax gently, the thermometer may easily break and scratch your hand. So you have to handle the red water filled thermometer with care. The second type is a digital thermometer. It's also a probe thermometer. How to use it? Press the power button. Either Fahrenheit degree or Celsius degree can be shown on the display screen. Keep pressing the degree C slash degree F button until the temperature unit is set on the display screen. A digital thermometer has a probe too. Dip the probe into the liquid wax. It takes time to heat up. You can't get the temperature readings instantly. When the readings stop increasing, that's the temperature of the liquid wax. The third type is infrared electronic thermometer guns. Press the power button. Point the thermometer at the liquid wax to take its temperature. Because it is infrared, the thermometer will tell you the surface temperature. In comparison, the probe thermometers may have more accurate readings. But you can make candles without knowing the exact temperature of the liquid wax. The thermometer gun is more convenient. So, I frequently use this one to get approximate temperature readings. Okay, these are the thermometers. The next tool is the wax containers. Heaters, heat guns, thermometers, and wax containers are the four-piece candle-making main tools. These four pieces are indispensable regardless of the candles you're making. The heating containers can be made of glass or stainless steel. When it comes to glass containers, you'd better get the high boron glasses or the thickened heat-resistant glass. The glass containers are often cheaper than the stainless steel containers. Then we usually use this type of wax melting bowl for less than 200g of wax, which will be more convenient for me. When you make one or two candles, this bowl is big enough. It has a wide brim. Its guide spouts are useful. You can pour the liquid wax into the molds without leaking wax. And this glass cup should also have a large spout. Many of the students need to take short videos. Aesthetically, this glass cup will look good. Get a glass cup with a large spout. So, you can pour the liquid wax with ease. Glass cups come in all sizes, including 500 milliliters, 1000 milliliters, and 1, 500 ml, etc. Just choose according to the amount of wax you use. This large stainless steel cup will come in handy when you're using a large amount of wax. You need to beat the wax before piping it. A tall cup will prevent the liquid wax from splashing when you're beating it. Aside from wax melting cups, we also need small measuring cups. There are different sizes of small measuring cups. Small measuring cups will come in handy when we make tiny accessories for candles, such as strawberries and blueberries. Or if the candles that you're making are formed from the wax of different colors, we need to pour the liquid wax into many measuring cups for coloring. Small measuring cups can be made of stainless steel or glass. The advantage of this set of measuring cups is that the bottom is relatively flat. You can easily put them on the wax heater. The wax will melt faster because its bottom has a large heating space. The wax heater can hold the flat-bottomed measuring cup steady. But the flaw of this type of cup is the small spouts. It's easy to leak wax and the wax will flow out from the side, especially when we pour the wax into the small details of the mold. This is a 100 ml measuring cup. It can be used whenever you melt less than 80 g of wax in this measuring cup. The measuring cups with larger spouts work better. But the price is higher. 
just base your choice on what you need. The small glass measuring cups like these are less expensive. The downside of this set is that it can become scalding hot if the temperature keeps rising. You can use the one with handle like this. Either one of these measuring cups is okay. You may have noticed that disposable paper cups were used for coloring in previous episodes, and then I threw them away without cleaning. But after using it for a period of time, we come to realize that it's not environment friendly and would be wasteful. I might find the dustbin full of paper cups after a day long candle making session. So, I have since given them up. The upside of the small measuring cup is that it can be cleaned and used repeatedly, which is more environmentally friendly. Besides, the liquid wax may cool down during the coloring process. In that case, reheat the wax along with these measuring cups. You can't put paper cups on a wax heater and heat them. So, I recommend the reusable small measuring cups if you need to color multiple portions of wax separately. In addition, get a mixer if you are making cake candles, decorative candles, and candles with top off. Wireless mixers are the best choice because they're convenient. Generally speaking, they come with two mixing heads of different sizes. The large one is used to beat a large amount of wax and the small one is used to beat a small amount of wax. Then look at the weighing tools. Please get an electronic scale that is accurate to 0.1 G. We need to weigh the additives sometimes. The addition amount of some additives is 1 slash 1000 or 2 slash 1000, which requires very accurate measurement. If the scale is not accurate enough, you may not be able to weigh out the right amount. So, the minimum accuracy of a scale should be 0.1 G and the maximum can be about 3000 G. You shouldn't overload the electronic scale. For instance, this scale can weigh from 0.1 G to 3,000 G. Don't put a heavier load on the scale. Otherwise, the overload is likely to damage the sensors and shorten the lifespan of the scale. Molds fall into three groups, silicone, PC plastic, and aluminum. PC molds are the most versatile. They're frequently used to make pillar candles, decorative candles, and candles in molds. This kind of conjoined mold works best. When the conjoined mold is used, it will give the candle top a better shape. If this is a split mold and it's not tightly stuck, or the split mold itself may be substandard, the edge of the candle won't look as good. That's why you should use the conjoined molds instead. The PC molds are suitable for many types of wax, including soy wax, paraffin wax, and palm wax. But don't pour gel wax into a PC mold. Otherwise, you can't separate the gel wax from the PC mold. Keep this in mind. Soy wax, beeswax, and paraffin wax can be poured into PC molds. The small, long molds are generally long and thin. It's usually split to facilitate the mold release. If it's a conjoined one, it's difficult to knock down, which means it's not easy to demold. So, the small long mold is generally split. These molds normally have a diameter of 2.2 cm or 2.5 cm. The larger mold with a usual diameter of 4 cm or 5 cm is commonly used. The thicker one may even have a 6 cm diameter. We've made many pillar candles in this size. Normal candles are all of this size. You can choose the mold size according to the candle shape you want to make. You can prepare the molds ahead of time. These candle molds can give candle tops different shapes. There are pillar flat tops as well as pointed tops. You can prepare some 5 cm molds, including pointed and flat top molds. There are also many special molds to choose from, such as cone molds, pyramid molds, and plum blossom molds. Select the molds that can meet your needs. Next, I'll talk about the silicone molds. These are all silicone molds. Usually, they're used to make wax sheets. You can make candle accessories like strawberries and blueberries with silicone molds. The silicone molds are also used for any wax. However, their pouring temperature is slightly higher than that of PC molds. We usually use silicone molds to make the modeling and simulation candles because silicone molds come in numerous shapes. Fruit candles and dessert candles are generally shaped by silicone molds. The third type is the aluminum mold. They only occasionally serve as palm wax containers to make special patterns, such as leather lattice candles. Aluminum can conduct heat faster and keep the temperature even. The aluminum molds can give more obvious yet even patterns to the candles made of palm wax. Don't use aluminum molds to make other candles. So you can choose according to your own needs. 
There is also a combination of a PC mold and a silicone mold. It has the form of a cup. This combination mold is usually a split type mold. It'll come in handy when you make an internal combustion cup. This is its only purpose. These are the regular molds. Let's get to know them first. Don't buy too many molds right away. Please watch my tutorial videos on the candles you want to make. Then, buy the molds at my recommendation. PC molds are the most versatile because the same PC molds shape lots of pillar candles. They're reusable. I'll discuss how to use each mold in a related video. All of these candle making tools are reusable. Next, I'll talk about the regular consumables. The first one is a candle wick, which is indispensable to every candle. Generally speaking, the candle wicks fall into four types according to their materials. The first type is the pure cotton candle wick, which is woven with pure cotton thread. The quality of candle wicks depends on if they're pure cotton or tightly woven. A tightly woven cotton thread is smokeless, and the tighter, the better. The second type is this kind of thread which is made of half cotton and half paper. It's tightly woven and even tighter than a cotton thread. Many people like its appearance and will choose this kind of fancy thread. This candle wick is smokeless too. The third type is the twine. This is a relatively natural wax material. This candle wick is made of natural twine and wrapped with a layer of natural beeswax. When burning, the waxed twine won't curl at the tip. So, it doesn't need frequent trimming. In comparison, these candle wicks should be trimmed almost every hour after burning for a period of time. Otherwise, the buildup of the excess carbon makes the candle wick curl at its tip and affects the burning flame as a result. The fourth type is the wooden candle wicks. You usually find them in the cup candles. They have a candle base at the bottom. Stick the candle base to the container with double stick tape. There'll be a crackling noise once you light up a wooden candle wick. The ambience the wooden candle wick gives appeals to lots of people. Trim the wooden candle wick to 3 mm to 5 mm above the wax surface. A long wick leads to unstable combustion. So, keep the wooden candle wick short. I've talked about the details in the episode on basic cup candles. The candle wicks may or may not be waxed. The wax-free candle wicks remain soft. Just put it through all kinds of candles. Unlike wax-free candle wicks, the waxed candle wick has a wax coating. They are harder. We usually use them in cup candles and small, well-shaped candles. Silicone molds don't come with the wick holes. Use a bamboo stick to poke a wick hole, and you can easily thread a waxed candle wick through the hole. It's difficult to get a soft candle wick through a wick hole. The wax-free candle wicks and the waxed candle wicks burn in the same way but both types are used in different situations. The waxed candle wicks are harder. They're the best when you may need to shape the candle wicks. You can buy the waxed candle wicks that have been inserted into their candle bases. This is what it looks like. It can use directly. Another way is that the candle wicks and the candle bases are separated and need to be installed by ourselves. Because the candles vary in length, you can cut the wick in half so that they fit the small candles. When you make a cup candle, insert the candle wick into a candle base. Then, use a clamp to keep the candle wick in place. You should pinch from one side of the candle base. Then, see if the candle base remains flat. However, many of the students pinch the candle base in this way. They pinch the middle of the candle base after the candle wick is inserted. When you do that, the candle base will be deformed. To avoid this, you must pinch from one side of the candle base. A flat candle base will work better. Nearly every candle needs a candle base. When it comes to a cup candle, its candle base is placed at the bottom of the cup. As for other well-shaped pillar candles, we also need to thread the candle wick through the center and then put the candle base at the bottom. Trim the candle wick to its optimum length. The candle base should be placed in the center. Its prime role is to extinguish the flame when the candle has burnt all the way through. The candle base will guarantee a safe burn. Thanks to the candle base, the candle won't damage the table down below. Aside from different materials and shapes, the candle wicks also vary in thickness. The thickness can be measured by the number of plies. They have 18 ply, 24 ply, 
and 35 ply. As the number of plies increases, the candle wick will get thicker, and the flame will get larger. So, let the diameter of the candle dictate the thickness of the candle wick. In general, the candle wick of a cup candle should be slightly thinner than that of a pillar candle. Soy wax and paraffin wax require different types of candle wicks. The candle wick for palm wax is not identical to the candle wick for soy wax. The thicker the candle wick is, the larger the flame will be. So, take the diameter of the candle into account when you pick the candle wick. Candles generally have a diameter of 4 cm or 5 cm. They usually use the candle wicks of 24 ply, 35 ply, or 45 ply. So, base your choice of candle wicks on the type of candles that you're making. You can also choose the candle wicks, which, according to the seller's recommendation, go with the diameter of the candles you're making. Let's look at some more tools. This is a wick hole opener. It's a common candle making tool. It's used to poke a hole in the center of the candle. Take small silicone molds, for example. They don't come with the wick holes. So, we should make the candles first and then poke the wick hole. To do that, we can heat the wick hole opener and then create a hole. This is another wick hole opener. It has a built-in heating device. Power this tool up, and the front metal will heat up. So, you don't have to heat the opener with a heat gun. You can get one of them. When using it, pay attention to its temperature, which cannot be too high. Otherwise, the hole on the candle may become too large, or too much wax around may get melted to affect the surface. Normally, this wick hole opener is good enough for the most part. Next, look at these measuring spoons. You'd better get a measuring spoon set. One set generally consists of measuring spoons of various capacities, such as 1.5 milliliters, 2.5 milliliters, 5 milliliters, 7.5 milliliters, and 15 milliliters. The measuring spoons are primarily used to measure the essential oil, as only a small amount is enough for a candle. The essential oil should constitute 7% to 10% of the wax. For example, add 7 grams to 10 grams of essential oil to 100 grams of wax. We should add about a spoonful of essential oil, about 7.5 milliliters, to 100 grams of wax. We don't need to use electronic scales, because the measuring spoon is more convenient for measuring the essential oils. These golden metal spoons are used for stirring. I used one-off sticks made of wood or bamboo to color the wax and disposed of them afterward. Now, I give them up because it's not eco-friendly. They're replaced by metal stirring spoons. Then you can wipe these metal spoons clean with ease. A heat gun can be used to melt the wax that can't be wiped away. Metal spoons are eco-friendly and easy to clean. This tea filter screen can be used as a sieve. Paraffin wax may come with dust or dirt sometimes. To remove impurities, you need to sift the paraffin wax into a mold. Sometimes the temperature is not high enough during coloring, and then there will be some undissolved particles in the block dye. They will sink to the bottom of the mold, thereby spoiling the appearance of the candle. To address this problem, you can remove the particles by sifting the paraffin wax into a mold. This is a small tool for use. The next one is a fine copper wire about 0.4 mm. Sometimes, the candle wick is too soft. You can hardly get it into a wick hole. Thus, fold the copper wire and then thread the loop through the wick hole. Put the candle wick through the loop. Then, pull the copper wire backward. You'll find the candle wick gets through the wick hole. Then plug the wick hole with the mold sealer, and the mold is ready. The copper wire is an aid to help you thread a candle wick through. When you're done, hook the copper wire onto a notch. I just plugged the wick hole with the mold sealer, which is a candle making staple. This is the original packaging of the mold sealer. Unwrap the mold sealer. It's reusable. Knead the mold sealer together. Once the wick hole is sealed with this, the mold won't leak liquid wax. Mold sealer is indispensable. After the wax is taken out of the mold, you can remove the mold sealer and set it aside for later use. When you need the mold sealer, pinch a piece off. This is quite useful. I'll talk more about the specific use of various tools when we use them. In addition, you can prepare a small scraper of any type. This one serves its purpose well. You can see my scraper has begun to warp. There's bound to be wax residue on the table when you make candles. 
blowing the large pieces of wax with a heat gun takes a long time. We can remove them with a scraper. It's quite a convenient tool to clean things up. This is a turning wheel. The best choice is a turning wheel made of metal. You have to clean things up after any candle making session. A heat gun may overheat a turning wheel made of plastic and melt its surface, leaving it uneven. If we use a metal turning wheel, it will be easier to clean. All you need to do is blow hot air over the metal turning wheel and wipe it clean. This turning wheel will be of great help when you're making cake candles or other decorative candles. The next tool is this wick holder. You need to center candle wicks when making pillar candles or candles in molds. A metal wick holder may serve this purpose. The hole in the middle also has large and small holes. Thread the wick through the big hole and clip it into the small one. When you pour the liquid wax into the mold, the candle wick will be fixed without moving. The disposable chopsticks can do the same job. The chopsticks are joined together. Put the chopsticks on top of the mold. Then, pull the candle wick to the spot where two thin sticks join together. Pull the candle wick upward to keep it tight. You can keep the candle wick in place with disposable chopsticks or a wick holder. The disposable chopsticks are reusable here. So, don't be concerned with wasting these chopsticks. The aforementioned tools are all reusable. Take your needs into account and choose wisely. I'm gonna talk about the candle dye used in the candle coloring. The candle dye is usually divided into three types according to its properties. These three types are liquid candle dye, solid candle dye, and powder candle dye. In terms of shapes, we divide them into these three types. Liquid candle dye and solid candle dye are the most popular. Powder candle dye is seldom used because it's not convenient to use and it is difficult to clean when it's splashed outside. That's why the other two types of candle dye are better options. Flame resistance is the first concern when you're choosing candle dye. The candle dye can't be flame retardant. Let me start with the liquid candle dye. It's divided into two types. One is the regular liquid candle dye. It's highly concentrated. It works for customized candles and decorative candles. Thanks to its high concentration, it'll be colored quickly. So, it's convenient. Each item comes with a dropper, making the coloring so much easier. First of all, let's look at the liquid candle dye. It has two types. One is regular liquid candle dye, and the other is non-penetrating candle dye. The regular liquid dye is highly concentrated. It can color plain pillar candles or fruit candles with ease. This one is made ahead of time. One drawback of the regular liquid candle dye is that you use different colors, and they touch each other. The colors will bleed into other candle parts. For example, this one was originally comprised of red and white wax. But now it's about a month. The white wax has turned red. This one was made at the same time. But it was colored with non-penetrating candle dye. The dye won't migrate elsewhere. Both the white and red wax get to keep their original colors. In contrast, the white wax of this candle has been tinged. The circumstance is the same whenever candle dye is used to decorate candles. This strawberry is colored with regular candle dye. Its white wax has turned red over time. This is the defect of regular liquid candle dye. The color set in the back is non-penetrating candle dye. You can distinguish both types from their wrapping paper. Regular candle dye is wrapped by a full color label. While non-penetrating candle dye has a white band across the middle of the wrappings. The fluorescent color makes the non-penetrating candle dye brighter than the regular one. Non-penetrating candle dye won't migrate over time. As a result, white wax can keep its original color. Additionally, this color set isn't flame retardant. There's no need to worry about flame resistance or color penetration. Non-penetrating candle dye is versatile. What's its drawback? Its concentration is low. A large amount of non-penetrating candle dye will be added to get a dark tone. This is its drawback. So, both types have their pros and cons. Just make your choice based on the circumstances. As for the block candle dye, it has two types. The regular block dye and the non-penetrating version. The regular block candle dye has two versions. High melting point version and low melting point version. The block dye with a high melting point tends to be more stable. 
It's suitable for palm wax and paraffin wax whose pouring temperature is high. This candle dye won't melt at low temperatures. To use it, open it first. Then whittle the candle dye with a pair of scissors or a knife and add the pieces to the wax for coloring. It is better to heat the wax while coloring it with this block candle dye. Only at high temperatures will this candle dye dissolve completely. The other type is the block candle dye, which melts at low temperatures. It's suitable for the wax whose melting point is low, such as the soy wax. The soy wax tends to get overheated if it's colored by the high temp block dye. The block candle dye won't dissolve at low temperatures as well. Therefore, if soy wax is used for a single color candle, we can choose a dye with a low melting temperature. Also, there's the non-penetrating version of the block candle dye. It comes in handy when coloring the accessories like strawberries. This is non-penetrating candle dye. This color set has 17 colors. The first eight colors, we call it macaron colors. Because those colors are pinky and light. Don't use too much of them, or the dye will make the wax flame retardant. The rest of the color set is not flame retardant or migrates over time. However, if you need to get the dark colored wax, the amount of non-penetrating candle dye required is relatively large. Because it has a lower concentration than regular candle dye. Sometimes you can't darken the tone. So, how should we choose the candle dye in practice? I recommend getting one set of regular candle dye and one non-penetrating candle dye. If you're not gonna make piping flower candles, pick a set of liquid candle dyes, plus a set of non-penetrating block candle dyes. But if you're gonna make piping candles, you can choose the two types of liquid candle dye. As this can color the candle accessories and piping candles. This set of non-penetrating liquid dyes is indispensable for flower piping candles. Then, you can choose another type of dye with a high or low melting point from the regular liquid candle dye. These are the basic explanation of the candle dye. As for the specific color mixing methods and color theories. I'll get into details about them in separate episodes. One more thing that we often use is an essential oil. Which is generally divided into natural essential oil and artificial fragrance oil. The artificial fragrance oil has a stronger aroma, and the general addition amount is about 5%. In comparison, the added amount of natural essential oil can reach 10% to 12% at most. The amount of essential oil depends on the wax materials. The natural essential oil has a mild aroma. The smell is not very strong and pungent, generally, 5% to 12% can be added. If you like a rich aroma, increase the amount. If not, decrease the amount. If the pouring temperature of a candle is high, say, 95 degrees C, 203.0 degrees Fahrenheit, or 100 degrees C, 212.0 degrees Fahrenheit. The essential oil can be added before the wax is heated to the pouring temperature. The natural essential oil will volatilize at high temperatures. Its aroma will become fainter afterward. Given natural essential oil is healthier, I highly recommend using it for handmade candles. If the candle contains chemical essential oil and the candle has been burning for over two hours, you must remember to open the window for ventilation and keep the air flowing. A measuring spoon can be used to add the essential oil. Just pour the essential oil into the spoon and then add it to the wax. With the measuring spoon, you can add the right amount of essential oil. I'll talk about the specific method of adding the essential oil in the episode on basic pillar candles and basic container candles. This episode is all about the basic tools and some commonly used consumables in candle making. In the actual operation, we will also use other materials according to different decorative candles as well as candle making techniques. I'll get into details in specific episodes. For example, you need special tools to make beeswax flowers. And you can't go without piping tips and certain molds to make decorative candles. The most important thing about candle making is the types of wax you select and what kind of effects can be achieved. In the next episode, I'll talk about the classification and use of wax materials. Hi, I'm Jade. I will introduce you to all types of candle waxes. Beginners can hardly keep up with various types of wax, including soy wax, paraffin wax, and gel wax. They have no idea what the temperature indicates, such as 52 degrees Celsius and 56 degrees Celsius. So, today let me inform you what each type of wax is and when to use it. 
I'll also introduce you to common additives for candles. The first one is soy wax, the most versatile wax. It's a vegetable wax extracted from natural sources. The wax is derived from the hydrogenated oil of soybeans. It's the most popular candle wax for craft candles and homemade candles. Let me place some on these plates and take a look. There are several types of soy wax commonly used in the market at present. They can come in many forms, flakes, pellets, and chunks. The first two are imported, while the last three are made locally in China. These soy waxes have different melting points. Please select a suitable type. I'll talk about imported soy wax first. A common imported type is Golden Brands 464 Soy Wax. It contains a soy-based additive to reduce frosting. It's thermally stable and designed for use in container candles. This soy wax can reduce white spots, improve cup wall adhesion, and increase fragrance distribution. That's why it's beginner's favorite. But soy wax itself is sensitive. Some may not adhere to the wall of candle cups due to the different operation processes or the temperature. I'll discuss cup dropping at length when demonstrating how to make the container wax. Golden Brands 464 is designed for use in container candles. Similarly, Cargill's Nature Wax C3 Soy Wax, melting points of 48 degrees Celsius or 49 degrees Celsius, is good for container candles. Golden Brands 415 Soy Wax is imported, too. It doesn't contain any additives. Beginners may come across white spots or bubbles. Golden Brands 415 should be used along with other types of wax or additives. For example, you can make a pillar candle with Golden Brands 415 and a little white beeswax. These are all imported soy waxes, which are more expensive than their domestic counterparts. It's the time to introduce the soy waxes made in China. It comes in three forms including flakes, pellets, and chunks. Soy wax chunks are soft. This type of wax is mainly used in the formula for piping candles. The piping candles contain several types of wax. Its main raw material is soy wax number 48, with a melting point of 48 degrees Celsius. It's included in all soy-based candle formulas no matter in summer, spring, autumn, or winter. This type of wax can't be rolled into flakes because of its relatively lower melting point. So, it comes in chunks. These soy wax flakes with a melting point of 52 degrees Celsius are designed for container candles. Candle makers can replace the imported soy wax by using less expensive domestic regular soy wax, number 52. It's a cost-effective option that is easy to buy. It's also one of our most favored choices for candles. This additive-free wax is ideal for candles without any dye. But after color mixing, the white spots may appear. You can tackle this issue by adding other types of waxes. Soy wax number 52 works perfectly fine without color mixing. Problems only arise when it's mixed with candle dye. I'll cover this in the episode on container, Candles 101. Another type of wax is soy wax, which melts at 56 degrees Celsius. It's produced by a local factory following my formula. This soy-based wax contains pure beeswax as well as additives that can smooth the surface. Some soy wax on trend have melting points below 52 degrees Celsius. They aren't designed for use in molded candles. The formula for molded candles normally includes soy wax with a melting point below 52 degrees Celsius and beeswax. This type can be the sole ingredient of molded candles. Just pour the melted wax into the molds at the suggested temperatures. These are common types of soy wax. Keep their melting points in mind when you use them. Soy wax that melts below 52 degrees Celsius is the best for container candles due to their low melting points, softness, and cup adhesion. But these candles may have white spots or adhesion issues. I'll suggest a solution in the episode on container, Candles 101. Soy wax that melts at a temperature above 54 degrees Celsius can be used to make a candle in a plastic or silicone mold. The wax for molded candles should melt at a temperature above 54 degrees Celsius. The most common wax is this one melting point, 56 degrees Celsius. You can also mix soy wax melting point of 52 degrees Celsius with beeswax proportionately. Please watch the episode on Pillar Candles 101 for more information. Soy wax chunks, whose melting point is as low as 48 degrees Celsius, are used to make piping candles. Alright. 
This is the overview of soy wax. The second type of wax is beeswax. It's highly popular among candle makers. The wax is formed by four pairs of wax-producing glands in the abdominal segments of worker bees. It has long been used as an ingredient in cosmetics such as lotions, lipsticks, and rouge. Beeswax, a substance secreted by honey bees, has a slight honey fragrance. The crude product obtained from the honeycomb has this yellow hue. The hues will vary depending on the seasons. You may wonder why two batches of beeswax look different. This is because the flowers the bees forage on change with the season. Hence, the wax has different shades of yellow, depending on the season. The beeswax in its natural state is yellow. The white beeswax is made of yellow beeswax after a decolorization treatment. So you can use the white beeswax to create lots of different colored candle designs. Beeswax is a general name for these types of products. When the factories make the beeswax, they divide the beeswax into different grades. Industrial waxes will be added to the naturally extracted beeswax during production. So, beeswax is offered in many grades according to the amount of other types of wax added. The top-tier wax is called pure beeswax. It's the result of 100% natural beeswax undergoing a decolorizing process. It has the highest concentration and the best flexibility. For instance, you have to use the pure beeswax to make beeswax flowers or other candle designs that need kneading. Beeswax is divided into grade A beeswax and normal beeswax according to the types of industrial wax added. The most versatile type is refined white beeswax, which has flooded the market. Refined white beeswax is nearly white. It contains various industrial waxes such as paraffin wax. So, it becomes nearly white. You often make pillar candles by mixing refined white beeswax with soy wax. This beeswax, which has little impurities, is off-white instead of pure white. So, top-tier beeswax is definitely not pure white. If the beeswax you buy is nearly white, it implies there are more impurities. As I said, soy wax melting point of 52 degrees Celsius is too soft to be the sole wax material of molded candles. That's why you should blend it with refined white beeswax. This will make the wax harder. Moreover, this formula facilitates the mold release because of the shrinkage of the wax. Another perk is that the candle can burn longer. Top-tier beeswax is malleable. It is perfect when it comes to lace candles, pure beeswax flowers, and curved decorative elements. I'll put the details of the specific application on each type of beeswax on the screen to give you a general idea. Then you can find the best beeswax for a candle design. Yellow pure beeswax comes first. This pure beeswax is not bleached. It looks pristine and natural. It's used to make old-school candles usually as is demonstrated in an episode. As there's no decolorizing process, yellow beeswax is naturally scented with the aroma of honey. So, the wax has a pleasant fragrance and a warm color. It's best suited for traditional candles. White pure beeswax is the raw yellow beeswax that undergoes a decolorizing process which remains 100% pure. So, white beeswax retains the natural fragrance of honey. To turn the beeswax white, factories may use bleaching agents, which may leave a bleach odor. People may not be accustomed to that smell. An essential oil can be used to mask the odor of the bleaching agent. White beeswax can be given any color you want. So, you can use colored white beeswax to create more candle designs. Grade A white beeswax is made from 50 to 70% beeswax. Pure beeswax contains 100% beeswax. Grade A white beeswax is second only to pure beeswax in terms of purity. Certain flexibility as it is, grade A white beeswax will crack if it's too cold. So, grade A white beeswax can be used to make candle designs that don't require high flexibility. You can also mix grade A white beeswax with other waxes proportionately to make carving candles and formula candles, etc. Refined white beeswax is the whitest and the most translucent. Industrial waxes are added to make the wax whiter and more flexible. Refined white beeswax is often mixed with other waxes according to a formula. A standard formula requires the combination of refined white beeswax and soy wax to make molded candles. The combination will help the candles shrink and become harder and smoother. Paraffin wax will become harder and more flexible when combined with refined white beeswax. 
The combination will cause shrinkage, which will facilitate demolding, and the paraffin wax will have a smoother surface with fewer bubbles. Paraffin wax is commonly used. Let's take a look. It's solid and translucent. Paraffin wax is a mineral oil extract. It's distilled from petroleum and other minerals. According to the grading system, there's crude paraffin wax for industrial use. There are also semi-refined paraffin wax and fully refined paraffin wax. When you make a custom-designed candle, fully refined paraffin wax is generally the choice. This wax is selected for its high purity. According to the shape, paraffin wax can be divided into block and granular wax. Paraffin wax blocks are often preferred. Generally, manufacturers procure high-purity paraffin wax to make it into blocks. That's why paraffin wax blocks are more popular. Paraffin wax's melting points vary a lot. These are all reference numbers of paraffin wax, number 48, 52, 54, to number 64. These numbers represent the lowest temperature at the paraffin wax melts. The lower the reference number, the softer the paraffin wax will be. Pillar candles and molded candles are usually made of paraffin wax, number 58, number 60, or number 62. I don't recommend the paraffin wax that melts at a higher temperature. Generally speaking, the paraffin wax melts at lower temperatures and tends to be clearer. But you may find bubbles in candles made of paraffin wax. Paraffin wax, number 48, is frequently used. It melts at a lower temperature. It's often used to make well-shaped wax, such as wax rolls or pebble stone candles. The wax remains relatively soft when it's just solidified after melting. You can cast it in many shapes. I'll use the paraffin wax, number 48, to make various fruit candles and post videos about them in the future. Paraffin wax can be shaped into flowers and other custom-designed candles. Use paraffin wax, number 58, number 60, or number 62, to make normal pillar candles. Paraffin wax, number 64, is generally used to make the outer wax shell of the container candles harder and stronger. This is the classification of paraffin wax according to melting points. Candles made of paraffin wax tend to have white spots or bubbles even though it is translucent. This is because water isn't completely evaporated during production. The distillation can't remove all the water, which creates bubbles on the candle. The consequence is the candles are dotted with white spots, which will affect the appearance. That's why you should pour paraffin wax into molds at high temperatures. So, heat the wax to at least 100 degrees Celsius. Heat the wax for longer to evaporate all the water. Add additive AC6 or Vibar to avoid these problems and make the candles even harder. A combination of additives can make the wax opaque and showcase its bright colors. It's time to talk about gel wax. This is an artificial wax. It's soft and transparent. Gel wax is generally more ornamental, which is suitable for making decorative elements. The wax is intended for custom-designed cup candles and crystal ball candles. We divide it into MP soft gel wax and HP hard gel wax. It feels like this when you press the MP soft gel wax. HP hard gel wax is not as hard as other solid waxes. It's just harder than MP soft gel wax. You can make ocean-themed cup candles and candles that do not need demolding with MP soft gel wax. If you must demold the candle, use HP hard gel wax instead. Gel wax is also a great material for crystal balls and transparent candles. Don't use the SHP Super Hard Gel Wax because gel wax is artificial. The harder the wax gets, the more likely it will emit black smoke. Due to the high melting point of HP Hard Gel Wax, don't ever set the wax heater to high heat or else there will be harmful black smoke. So, use the low heat setting to melt this wax. And give it enough time to melt slowly. A lot of the audiences are concerned about bubbles. Don't count on the additives to free the gel wax of bubbles because they will affect its transparency and purity. Remove bubbles by controlling the temperature of the gel wax. The melted gel wax that never reaches 100 degrees Celsius will have more bubbles. Let it thicken slowly. If you heat the gel wax to over 120 degrees Celsius, the liquid wax will be sure to have fewer bubbles. So, keep the temperature of gel wax under control. For more information, please watch the episode about making gel wax candles.
Keep in mind that only silicone molds are acceptable when you're using gel wax. Hard molds like PC plastic molds can't be used. Otherwise, you can't separate the gel wax from the hard molds. But if only MP soft gel wax is at hand, you can still make molded candles by adding gel wax powder. Gel wax powder may come in lumps. Just break the lumps into powder by yourself. Add the powder to the MP soft gel wax. This additive should constitute about 5% of the wax's weight. The gel wax will get harder as a result. Okay. Let's move on to butter wax, aka ghee wax. This wax is extracted and synthesized from animal milk. So, it's also classified as natural wax material. Butter wax melts at only 41 degrees Celsius or so. In summer, the butter wax remains soft at room temperature. You can always practice piping with butter wax if it isn't the scorching summer. The wax is soft. It burns steady. And thanks to its low melting point, it adheres to the candle cups very well. It's used to make container candles with soy wax, improving cup adhesion. The wax is an excellent material for ice cream candles and latte art candles. This is because the wax resembles cream or ice cream, often under the right conditions. Next, I want to inform you of palm wax. This wax comes from palm fruit. Palm wax and crystal palm wax are the most popular in this category. Stearic acid is also one of the palm waxes. Palm wax and crystal palm wax differ in the pattern they produce. Palm wax looks like this kind of particle. They are round and grainy. Chinese domestic palm wax will create a feather-like pattern. Crystal palm wax is a combination of flakes and powder. It'll give the surface of candles a small snowflake pattern. The pattern varies slightly depending on where the palm wax comes from. Just select a palm wax that meets your needs. Crystal palm wax is harder than palm wax. The latter adheres to the candle cup more firmly. So, the mold release becomes more difficult. You can add stearic acid or palm wax additives to harden palm wax and facilitate mold release. This additive should account for about 10% of the wax weight. In addition to making the wax harder, stearic acid will also alter the pattern of the wax surface. As the proportion of stearic acid changes, so does the pattern. You'll have a lot of fun making these candles. Just experiment with different proportions of the additive. Moreover, different pouring temperatures produce different patterns too. Let's say the pouring temperature is below 62 degrees Celsius. There are horizontal stripes on the surface, just like rocks. If the wax is poured into molds at 90 degrees Celsius, there will be a feather-like pattern or a texture of snowflakes. It'd be highly enjoyable to make these candles. Please take advantage of these characteristics to design beautiful candles. Molds are sensitive to the temperature, too. So, we use different molds to produce different textures. Aluminum molds conduct heat quickly, spreading the heat evenly across the mold wall. Therefore, the patterns made of aluminum molds with palm wax will help you create a nicer pattern than PC molds. In conclusion, the waxes introduced are the most commonly used waxes. Other waxes will come in handy from time to time. I'll talk about them in length when the time comes. So, this is the overview of common waxes. You should know a couple of things about them in advance. Then, you can figure out the wax materials of the candles. If you're looking at a translucent candle, the best guess is that it's made of paraffin wax. If you see some snowflakes and ice patterns on the candle's surface, you can judge that it may be made of palm wax. You'd better know a thing or two about them. This is a basic introduction to these waxes. In the operation process, you will also use some additives, which will be introduced in a future episode. I'll introduce some common candle additives that big candle brands don't want you know. The first one is the micro wax, which can be generally divided into soft micro wax and hard micro wax. It belongs to an extract of mineral oil. Soft micro wax or soft wax is often used for making candles in different shapes. For example, we will add soft wax into pure beeswax so that it can be softer and more flexible, which helps crack into different shapes. It is soft at room temperature, so we also use it to paste some candle accessories. For example, when we make a pillar candle with a small decoration like an animal photo, we can use soft wax. It is softer in summer while hard in winter. 
just blow it with hot air from an AC for a while before using it in winter, and then you can rub it into shapes you want. It can also be used for gluing candle decorations in making cakes. Some cake styles need decorations like strawberries and blueberries, so we can use soft micro wax to be as the glue. The main function of hard micro wax is to make candle surfaces smoother. It can also increase the flexibility to some extent. We can also add it to the soy wax pillar candle, which can not only make the candles smoother, but also solve the problem that candles crack easily in winter. The next additive is Paraffin Enhancer AC6. AC6 is a commonly used additive in paraffin wax. The proportion of it is very small. Usually, 1% is enough. We use it to improve the hardness of paraffin wax as well as decrease white spots and bubbles. The third additive is Vibar 103, which is also used in paraffin wax to increase the hardness. We can see that the surface of paraffin wax becomes very smooth. Vibar 103 is very good at improving smoothness. Moreover, it can also decrease white spots and bubbles, which it does better than AC6. Paraffin wax becomes whiter and is not so transparent after adding Vibar 103. AC6 has the same effect, but is weaker than Vibar 103. So, if you don't care about the transparency of a candle, then Vibar 103 is much better, because its effect is really good. For those candles made of soy wax and paraffin wax, we can use Vibar 103 when the white spots appear. Vibar 103 has a strong effect in removing white spots. Another one is paraffin brightener, which can make paraffin wax more transparent. However, it cannot make paraffin wax completely. If the surface of paraffin wax is not very clear, then the effect can be seen. The other one is gel wax powder, which is also a kind of additive. As we said before, the function of it is to increase the hardness of gel wax. If you feel gel wax is not hard enough, then you can add some gel wax powder. The proportion of it is 5% and melt them together. The melting point of gel wax powder is very high, so the melting process needs a longer time. And the temperature cannot be too high, otherwise, the gel wax in it will burn to smoke. So please be patient when melting them. It is a powder that can be used when some candle styles need powder decorations. For example, some cake candles need to add powder like powdered sugar or icing. Some candles with a Christmas theme also need decorations like snowflakes. These can be realized with gel wax powder. Then, let's talk about palm wax additive stearic acid. We've discussed it before, and it is a kind of palm wax. We add stearic acid to palm wax to increase its hardness so that it can be demolded easily. There is also an additive named 020 particles, which, in fact, is a kind of super hard gel wax. But it is too hard to be used directly. The application of it in our class is to be as a seal of a plaster cup so that when candles melt, the liquid wax cannot flow out of the plaster cup. But the melting point of it is very high, so the melting takes a longer time, and it is not easy to clean it. Therefore, we suggest that a little gel wax can be added to it, and then the melting will be easier. The next one is the paraffin foaming agent, QP101, which is used for making simulated cake candles with paraffin wax. The operative method is melting it and paraffin wax together, and the proportion of it is 1.5% to 2%. When the temperature decreases to 40 degrees Celsius, we can use a blender to stir it, and then it will foam. We will show you the operation, specifically in cake candle lessons. Well, the next one is a modifier. To be exact, it is a kind of color modifier. The main function of it is to make the colors brighter. Let's take a look at the color stabilizer, which is often used for candle making in factories. It can remain the color we tinted for the candles, and it can also protect candles from ultraviolet and discoloring. The last one is the fluorescent agent, which can make candles color in fluorescent effect. If we add this to candles, then these candles can shine fluorescent light under UV lamps. So, it is often used in candles for life enhancers. If you want to make some fluorescent candles, you don't need to prepare special pigments along. You can add some fluorescent agents into common pigments, and then they will become fluorescent pigments. Great! Now we know some common candle additives, they are widely used in the candle industry. And even, for those famous brands. Hello, I'm Jade. Let's talk about the Pillar Candles 101. 
Pillar candles are also known as molded candles, indicating the candles made from PC plastic molds or silicone molds. These candles should have enough hardness and a certain degree of shrinkage so you can easily remove them from the molds. Pillar candles are integral to many stylized candles. Let me show you the wax materials needed to make the pillar candles. There are several formulas. This episode is primarily about how to use soy wax to make pillar candles. Soy wax can be classified according to its melting point. The most common candles on the market are composed of soy wax melting points below 52 degrees Celsius. This wax type is good for container wax. For example, Soy wax made in China has a melting point of 52 degrees Celsius, and the imported ones, such as 464 or C3, are all container wax. They're too soft for molded candles. On one hand, you can hardly take the candle out of a mold. On the other hand, you can easily put handprints on the surface. So, you need to increase its hardness, shrinkage, and smoothness on the surface. Generally, regular soy wax melting at 52 degrees Celsius should be mixed with beeswax. The beeswax will make the mixture harder and smoother. Thanks to beeswax, the mixture shrinks as it cools down, making the mold release so much easier. Apply this formula with local soy wax that melts at 52 degrees Celsius or imported ones such as 464 and C3. Given that soy wax becomes softer on a hot summer day, it's best to mix it with beeswax in a ratio of 1 to 1. Soy wax gets harder in autumn and winter. So, change the ratio with the seasons. In autumn, a good ratio is 6 to 4. This means using 60% of soy wax, and the remaining 40% is beeswax. Change the ratio to 7 to 3 in winter. When it gets cold, the proportion of the beeswax shouldn't be too high, or else, the finished products may have cracks. Please keep this in mind. Additionally, you can add 2 to 5% hard micro wax to make the mixture more malleable and thermally stable. So, please change the ratio between soy wax and beeswax accordingly. We could use the refined white beeswax because of its malleability. Grade A beeswax is great for this formula too. Beeswax of higher grade, with more beeswax contained, is preferred because of its stability. It is time to discuss the second formula in which white beeswax is replaced by paraffin wax to make the candle smoother and harder. Plus, paraffin wax is less expensive. You can combine soy wax with paraffin wax for mass sales or low-budget orders. I will mix soy wax melting at 52 degrees Celsius with paraffin wax melting point of 58 degrees Celsius. For the paraffin wax, you can use either granular paraffin or block paraffin as long as the standard melting point is within the range of 58 to 60 degrees Celsius. What's the disadvantage of this formula? You may find white spots or bubbles on candles consisting of paraffin wax. To avoid this, you can add hard micro wax to the mix. The new addition will make the finished product more malleable and stable. Hard micro wax will smooth the surface. Combining imported soy wax 415 and paraffin wax can produce such white spots easily. Look. I followed the standard method when making this candle. The paraffin wax has made the finished product shrink. Because the paraffin itself is contractile, the candles that contain paraffin wax will have such a concavity. The higher the pouring temperature is, the deeper the concavity will be. Look at all these white spots on the surface. An additive should be included in this formula to improve the appearance of candles. This additive for paraffin wax comes in particles. The product name is Vibar 103. The additive should be used in tiny amounts. Only 1 per thousand of the total wax amount will be sufficient. Let me compare two candles. These two candles are made of the same bowl of wax. I melted the wax and colored it. Poured some into one mold. Then, I mixed the rest with the additive Vibar 103 and poured the mixture into another mold. Both candles turn out quite differently. The one without the additive is riddled with white spots. But the one with the additive is especially smooth and has no white spot at all. Therefore, whenever a formula contains paraffin wax, this additive must be used to improve its surface condition. In addition, in the first formula, if the grade of beeswax used is low, it will contain paraffin. If you also encounter white spots when making candles, you can add additives like Vibar 103 to get rid of them. Look at these candles' bottoms. 
you can see the shrinkage is less noticeable, thanks to the additive. The opposite is true if no additive is used. Formula number two must include the additive. You can make your choice. Then there's the third formula. Formula number three is that we use pillar soy wax to make candles directly. The pillar soy wax is customized. This imported one melts at 54 degrees Celsius. And this pillar soy wax is manufactured by a local factory on our order. This one melts at 56 degrees Celsius. This pillar soy wax contains beeswax, additives, and a small amount of stabilizer. It is quite stable to make pillar candles. The shrinkage is not very noticeable at the bottom. You don't need to add any other material to make a molded candle. This wax should be good for year-round use. In the hot summertime, you can add 10 to 20% beeswax to increase its hardness. You don't need to add other kinds of wax in other seasons. Cracks may appear due to too much beeswax. In conclusion, select a formula based on what kinds of wax you have available. I'm going to make a pillar candle with soy wax. The most commonly used mold is PC plastic mold. These molds often have a diameter of 4 cm or 5 cm. Others may have a larger diameter, such as 6 cm or 7 cm. Those who are making cake candles need a mold with a diameter of 8 cm or 9 cm. Just choose a mold that meets your needs. Silicone molds can serve the same purpose as PC molds. Likewise, you can follow one of the three formulas using silicone molds. The difference is that the pouring temperature is higher. If the wax you pour into a silicone mold is not hot enough, you'll find horizontal stripes on the candle surface. The low pouring temperature will make the surface uneven and create horizontal stripes. I poured the wax into a silicone mold at about 59 degrees Celsius. And this is what the finished product looks like. This shows you a low pouring temperature will make the surface uneven. So, silicone molds require a higher pouring temperature. In general, soy wax is poured into a silicone mold at 85 degrees Celsius. The minimum pouring temperature is 80 degrees Celsius. For PC plastic molds, the pouring temperature ranges from 70 degrees to 85 degrees Celsius, depending on the kind of wax. For silicone molds, the pouring temperature should not be lower than 80 degrees Celsius. Their optimum pouring temperature ranges from 85 degrees to 90 degrees Celsius. In addition to the existing molds, you can make pillar candles in other items, such as milk cartons and snack boxes. After solidification, we remove the outer package, which is a pillar candle. Those with no suitable cake mold can replace it with a container of a similar size you have. For instance, I find this glass measuring cup large enough. So I use it to make a candle. Take out the cup-shaped candle later. It can be used in any shape. So you have more options than just silicone molds and PC molds. Now, I'll demonstrate the whole process of making a molded pillar candle. First, weigh out the wax. You may not be aware of the wax capacity of your mold. There's a way to work it out. Place the mold on an electronic scale. Reset the electronic scale to zero. Fill the mold with water. Measure the weight of the water. The wax capacity equals 0.85 times the weight of the water. This is because wax is lighter than water. The electronic scale reads 78.9 grams, which we can calculate as 80 grams 0.85 times 80 equals 68. This means the wax capacity of the mold is 68 grams. Please work out the wax capacity of your mold in this fashion. Now, weigh out the wax I need. I'll use pillar soy wax that melts at 56 degrees Celsius for demonstration. This wax melting bowl is perfect for making a candle weighing 200 grams or less. This bowl is quite useful. Its guide slot can prevent wax leaks. I'll use different molds for the demonstration today. That's why I need to melt a lot of wax to fill these molds. Under the circumstances, I'll use a large measuring cup. Melt the wax first. I recommend doing this in a stainless steel measuring cup. Those who videotape the making process can use a glass measuring cup instead. But overheated glass will crack. So glass measuring cups have their risks. This is an 800 watt wax heater. The thermal board will reach a temperature of over 200 degrees Celsius even if you set the wax heater to low heat. 
An ordinary measuring cup may crack once its temperature rises above 150 degrees Celsius. So a stainless steel measuring cup is a safer choice. Besides, keep the temperature of soy wax under 100 degrees Celsius, or else the wax will become yellow and unstable. That's why people say the colors vary when making many candles in a row. Please pay attention to the temperature of soy wax. Overheated soy wax will turn yellow. So, never leave the wax heater unattended. You need to make sure it's safe and monitor the wax temperature. Stir the melting wax once in a while. You can use this probe thermometer to stir the wax. The stainless steel probe will not create bubbles. Mix the solid and liquid wax, or the lower part is overheated while the upper part has not melted yet. Therefore, you should stir the melting wax at intervals to monitor it. Don't switch off the wax heater after the wax has melted completely. Switch off the wax heater when the wax temperature rises above 80 degrees Celsius. Let the lingering heat on the thermal board melt the rest of the solid wax. Needless to say, the wax will be overheated if you wait until the wax completely melts to switch off the wax heater. I put the candle wicks in place while heating the wax up. You can do this later if your mold is large and thin. In that case, put the candle wick in place after the wax is set. But you need to thread candle wicks through PC molds in advance. You can use either soft, cotton, or waxed wicks. I prefer the latter because it's harder. I can easily get the wick into a wick hole. Trim a candle wick to its optimum length. Then, plug the wick hole with the mold sealer. Use a wick holder to center the candle wick. Clip the candle wick into the smaller side of the wick holder. Those who have difficulty getting a soft wick through can watch the previous episode of this series. In that episode, I demonstrated how to thread a thin copper wire through a wick hole and then lead the soft wick through. You can make waxed wicks yourself if you like. All you need to do is submerge the wick in liquid wax and then remove it. Wipe the excess liquid wax and let the candle wick dry off. By then, the waxed candle wick will be ready. It will be as good as the waxed wicks on the market. So, thread a candle wick through a PC mold. Most silicone molds don't come with wick holes. If the silicone mold is tall, you'd better poke a wick hole directly. If the mold is short, you can heat a positioning pin and poke it through from the center of the mold. I made a wick hole in the center of this tall mold to get rid of cracks. A thick mold is normally leak-proof, even if you poke a hole and put a candle wick in place. Get a waxed candle wick through the wick hole you've just made. Since a waxed wick is hard, you can easily get it through a wick hole. Set it aside for later use. Don't make a wick hole in a thin mold. This mold is not stretchy. The wick hole you poke on this mold will be torn into an even bigger hole, through which the wax will leak out. So, I will make a wick hole on the candle during the making process. This applies to glass cups, bottles, milk cups, and paper boxes you use to make the candles. You can wait until candles are removed from these molds to poke the wick holes. Please follow these formulas to make molded candles by using any molds I mention. There's an exception, though. Don't use soy wax to make candles with complicated patterns. We'd better use 100% pure beeswax for the candles with details because it's malleable enough to prevent fracture. Using soy wax to make a complicated candle, you can hardly release the delicate candle in one piece from the mold. That's why I suggest using pure beeswax to make these decorative elements. For example, we hope this decor can bend a radian and paste it on the candle body after it's finished. But you aren't supposed to use soy wax. Use pure beeswax instead. Get the best beeswax you can find from the market, and it was worth it. I'll demonstrate more in part 2 of Pillar Candle 101. Okay, we can see that there are some granules stick to the inner wall when most of the wax is melted. We can use a thermometer or a stirring stick to take these granules off. You can use a heat gun to deal with those sticky granules. Now the temperature is over 80 degrees Celsius, and almost all the solid wax is melted and there is only a small part of the solid in the container. At this time, we can turn off the stove, and the heat of the panel can be kept for a short time so the lingering heat can melt that part. If we don't turn off the fire until all solid wax is melted, then the liquid wax may be too hot to be used. So we turned off the heater now and still put the wax melting cup on the panel to wait for the wax to melt totally. 
well, we will make it with the PC plastic mold now. We need to pour some liquid wax out for the PC mold, and 200 grams is enough. Put the rest of the wax on the heater again, to maintain the temperature. Now, we can begin to mix the colors. Both liquid and solid candle dyes are suitable for toning soy wax. The solid, concentrated candle dye can be divided into two kinds according to the operating temperature. One kind is for low temperatures, and the other one is for high temperatures. The temperature for liquid wax cannot be too high, so we chose the low temperature candle dye to do the toning of soy wax candles. Generally, the solid candle dye for high temperature is used to color paraffin wax candles. You can also use liquid candle dye like this to do the coloring. If you want to make a candle with two colors and the two colors are both mixed, then you can use ordinary dyes. But if one of the colors is white and the other is colored, then the colored one needs to use the non-penetrating dye, which will prevent it from smudging the white color after they contact for a long time. If you want to make candles with only one color, then ordinary concentrated dye is enough, whether it is liquid or solid candle dye. Now, let's adjust the color. When we adjust colors, we'd better choose a dye with lower purity or higher brightness. This means lighter colors or darker colors are better than intermediate colors with high purity. We will specifically talk about color adjustment knowledge in related courses. Okay, we use this red bean color, and just two drops are enough. This color has also reduced purity. A lighter color is better. The dye should be fully stirred when we put it in. If the temperature of the liquid wax is low, the dye may not melt sufficiently. Then, we need to turn on the heater and melt it while stirring it, especially for the solid candle dye. Because there will be such precipitated particles of dye on the candle if you don't melt them completely, which will affect the final appearance. So remember to offer enough time and a suitable temperature when stirring. Okay, you can take drops of liquid wax on a whiteboard or scraper and check whether the color is what you want. You can see that the color of liquid wax differs a lot from the drops after solidification, so we need to do the color testing. The color solidified on the board is close to the final color of the candle. But remember that the color on the testing board is still lighter than the final color as it is too little, only several drops. The color of the liquid wax is totally different. If you think the color is not dark enough, you can add candle dye again. So we'd better add a little dye at the beginning and repeat the process according to your needs. Finally, you can get the color you want. We can add the essential oil after the candle dye mixes into the liquid wax fully. Use this 7.5 milliliters measuring spoon to take essential oil, and two spoons are enough. The proportion of essential oil is between 7% and 10%. You can add according to your preference. I often use this 7.5 milliliters measuring spoon to add essential oil and I like to add one spoon for each 100 grams of wax. Stirring the wax fully after adding the essential oil. Now the temperature of liquid wax is around 75 degrees Celsius as the pouring temperature for PC molds is 75 degrees Celsius. We use natural essential oils here. The flavor of artificial fragrance oil is stronger, but its burning time is long, which is not good for the health. We need to open the window for ventilation when using it. So, natural essential oil is better when you make candles by yourself. The pouring temperature of PC mold is between 75 to 80 degrees Celsius and not lower than 75 degrees Celsius in winter, while 70 degrees Celsius is okay in summer. Now begin the pouring. If you ensure that the dye is completely melted and there are no impurities, then you can pour directly without filtering the liquid. Well, you can see that there are still a few granules in it, so it's better to filter when pouring the liquid wax into the mold. We fix the candle wick now. We need to pay attention that for molds like this, don't pour too much liquid wax in it and leave some space for demolding. If it's too full and the weather is hot, the candle will have poor shrinkage. Then you cannot demold the candle out easily. Put the mold aside and wait for solidification. Normally, the solidification needs 4 hours for such a pillar candle. In the same way, we mix the candle dye and add the essential oil. Then, we pour the remaining liquid wax into the mold. For this glass cup, I want to make a candle with a topping that has a feeling of snowfield. I want to make a lake blue bottom, and the upper part is white, so I need to use the group of non-penetrating candle dye. 
The temperature of the liquid wax drops a little, and the candle dye is not easy to melt, so we need to put the wax on the heater and warm it up again. We also need to check the temperature and ensure it is not too high. Okay, it is 68 degrees Celsius. The non-penetrating candle dye is easy to melt if the temperature is over 70 degrees Celsius. And we need to monitor the temperature. It shouldn't exceed 85 degrees Celsius. We also need to do color testing and adjust the color according to your needs. If you think the color is light, you can add the candle dye again and do color testing again. We need to see the color after it becomes solidified. Now the color is light lake blue, which is what I want. We can add essential oil now. There are 160 grams of wax, so we need to add one and a half spoonful of the essential oil. After adding it, make sure to fully stir it, and then don't pour it immediately. We can put it aside for a while, to avoid the bubbles on the surface. When we want to use the bottom shape of this cup, we can pour into it directly. The method to avoid the bubbles is to pour the liquid wax with a stirring stick, which is made of stainless steel instead of a wooden one. A wooden stirring stick will generate the bubbles at high temperatures by itself. We can pour the liquid wax along the stirring stick and use a heat gun to blow the bubbles if there are some. And then put it aside to wait for solidification. For this one with full liquid wax, we can use a wick holder to fix the candle wick. Bend the holder, and then it will not touch the liquid wax. If it touches the liquid wax, they will solidify together, making the final product not so beautiful. The pouring temperature for silicone molds is a little higher. Okay, I'm waiting for the solidification after pouring. For these two candles, we need to make the wick holes when they initially solidify but don't become hard totally. So, when the margin is hard while the inner part is relatively soft, we can use a positioning pin to locate a hole for the candle wick. About one hour later, we can poke the hole for a candle wick. Now, let's see if this candle has solidified, but its surface is still soft. When it is not completely hardened, we can leave a wick hole for it now. You can poke a hole in the middle or leave it on the side, just according to your plan. For this one, I want to poke the hole in the middle. We poke it in the wax, and you can see some soft wax pasted on the pin. Because the inner part doesn't solidify fully, we need to poke it again after a while when the wax becomes harder enough. In this way, the hole for the candle wick is ready. Just poking once is not enough because the liquid in the middle will be filled when the inner wax becomes harder, and the hole will be blocked. For this candle, the hole is slightly off-center. We can see the positioning pin is clean, which shows that the inner part has solidified already, so we don't need to poke again. Just rotate the pin to make the hole larger, and the hole will still be there even when the candle becomes solidified totally. For this one, we need to poke again after a while. We don't need to repeat this step until the positioning pin is clean when it is out of the hole. Let's take a look at this candle. There will be such a hole if the pouring temperature is too high. We need to deal with the hole when the candle doesn't solidify totally. Smash all the wax around the hole and make the hole exposed entirely. We need to take care and don't break the edge. When the hole is exposed entirely, we can add liquid wax into it to fill this hole. So, we need to keep some liquid wax in advance after adjusting the colors. What should we do if we didn't leave the wax in advance and now have no wax to fill the hole? We can use a heat gun to melt the surface after smashing around the hole and let the liquid wax flow until the surface is flat. Wait for solidification, and it will be okay. Don't pour the liquid wax directly into the hole because you feel that the hole is small, but actually, it is deep and big. You will find that there is still a hole after solidification. So, we must remember to smash all the wax around the hole until the hole is exposed entirely, and then we can deal with the surface. Such situations usually occur when the pouring temperature is too high, or the wax material in the formula shrinks too much. Okay, we can demold it when it is completely solidified. For pillar candles like this one, the solidification needs at least 4 hours. We can see that this candle, which is made of pillar soy wax, number 56, almost has no depression on the surface. This wax doesn't need to be poured twice. This one is made of pillar soy wax, directly. This one is made of the formula of half soy wax and half paraffin wax. You can see the surface is dented badly. So, if you make candles like this one, remember to leave some liquid wax for later use. 
After it's initially solidified, you can melt the remaining wax to 80 degrees Celsius and pour the liquid wax into the mold to make the surface flat. Otherwise, the surface is too ugly. This candle is made of pure paraffin wax, and the depression inside is deeper because the shrinkage of the paraffin wax is strong. And there's some water in the production process of paraffin wax, which will strengthen its shrinkage. So, if there is paraffin wax in your formula, remember not to pour it into the mold completely, but to leave some wax for secondary wax replenishment. The special pillar candles or those candles that add paraffin or beeswax have a certain degree of shrinkage, so they are easy to demold. We take off the mold sealer at first and wring the mold like wringing clothes with both hands in opposite directions. For this candle, the candle body and the mold wall are stuck together. So we just ring the mold, and then the candle will break away from the mold. We can check and ring the parts where the candle is still stuck with the mold wall. And then the candle can be pulled out easily like this. If the candle is stuck tightly with the mold wall and, after twisting, you cannot pull it out, then you can knock it on the table. Repeat this step until the candle is out. The surface of the candles will be very smooth if the formula has no problem. Don't touch the candle with your hands repeatedly after demolding, especially for candles mainly made of soy wax. If the weather is hot, touching repeatedly will leave fingerprints on the surface. If you put the candle aside for a long time and dust falls on the surface, wipe it clean with a wet paper towel or wash it under the tap. Another point is that in summer it is not easy to demold if the weather is too hot. You know that candle's hardness is related to the temperature so they are softer in summer while harder in winter. So, demolding in summer may be more difficult even with the same formula. We can put the solidified candle in the freezer and take it out after 10 minutes. Then, ring it, and you will find it is easier to pull the candle out. When demolding candles from the silicone molds, we need to stretch out the mold first and ensure that the candle has separated from the mold completely. And then we can take the candle out easily. Soft molds like this one can be opened directly from the opposite direction. For this glass container, it is difficult to demold the candle. We cannot easily ring it as acrylic mold. If it can't be knocked down, we need to put it in a freezer to make the candle separate from the mold. Because it sticks to the mold wall firmly, unlike PC mold, we can't ring it. So the best way is to put it in a fridge. Okay, when we take it out from the fridge, we knock it again, and then we find that it is easy to pull the candle out. When you find the mold or the container is too hard to ring or demold, or the wax is too soft in hot summer. You can put the mold in a freezer to freeze it. Remember, it must be done after the candle is solidified. Put it in the freezer compartment instead of the refrigerator compartment. 10 minutes is enough, and then you can take out the shape you want. We can install a candle base at the bottom of the pillar candle that pokes a wick hole first. We advise installing a candle base at the bottom of all candles, it can be flame retardant. Whether you place the candle on the table or the candlestick. When the candle burns to the end, the flame will burn black if it touches the table or candlestick directly. There's a certain risk. But when the flame reaches the candle base, it will extinguish automatically. So it is safer. Then, we must choose suitable candle wicks according to their combustion range. Now, let's look at these two candles without candle wicks, but only wick holes. Even though we made the wick holes when the wax solidified, the hole didn't completely open on the surface when it was finally demolded. Therefore, we need to poke the hole with a heated positioning pin. If you use a cold pin to poke the hole directly, the candle may crack. You can repeat this step softly until the hole is made from top to bottom. Then we use this kind of waxed wick with a candle base. We can install the candle base if the candle wick has no base on it. Thread the waxed wick through the candle base and clamp it with a pair of pincers. Don't clamp from the bottom to avoid deforming the candle base. Clamp from the upside of the candle base and clamp from one side. If you clamp from the central bottom, the candle base may be like this, and it will be uneven. Take this point in your mind, install the candle base like what I do first, then poke the wick in, and then go down to the bottom. Pillar candles like this one can be used directly, and many of them are used to do cake models or decorations. In conclusion, it is about how to make a pillar candle or mold candle. We will use this basic knowledge in our courses. Try to make more pillar candles, and if you master the basic knowledge well, you can learn about candle decorations easily. 
let's look at the Container Candle 101. There are plenty to choose from. Many glass containers come in handy when you make container candles. Aluminum boxes are an alternative. Keep a lid on an aluminum box, and you can take this candle with you. Pour different waxes into tiny aluminum boxes, and then you can have the one with your preferred aroma on you anytime. The lid has another purpose, extinguish a fire by starving it of oxygen. Lift the lid before lighting the candle, and close the lid to extinguish the flame. Those concerned about glass adhesion issues may also go with the opaque containers. Look at those leading brands of scented candles out there. You can barely find scented candles in transparent containers. Scented candles usually come in holographic containers or beautifully patterned containers. Candle brands tend to use containers in distinctive shapes to embellish their candles. They make container candles by simply pouring natural soy wax into awesome containers. There are also DIY candle containers. This one, for example, is our plaster candle holder. It's fairly generic as far as a handmade candle goes. As a candle maker, I do make plaster candle holders myself. I usually use them to mold soy wax before adding decorative elements. Everything can be handcrafted. One thing to note about plaster candle holders though. They must be made of aroma plaster powder with high density. The one with low density isn't good enough because there'll be wax oil on the outside of the plaster candle holder if it holds burning candles for an extended period of time. The plaster candle holder won't look nice anymore. On the other hand, you can pour liquid wax into a container made of high-density plaster powder and light up the candle directly. If you're still worried, add a layer of wax to isolate the plaster candle holder from the wax. In a later episode, I'll use candle additive number 020 to make layered candles. That method can work, but it's not easy to handle. It's also a good practice to use water-based resin to separate the wax from the plaster candle holder. Just brush the candle holder with any oilproof liquid and let it dry off. Then, pour the wax into the candle holder. The water-based resin can stop wax oil from seeping out. I'm making three candles with different types of candle wicks today. I won't color every candle. Let me take you step by step through how to make container candles. Please pick a container yourself. Some people have no idea how much wax their container can hold. I suggest that they fill their container with water and weigh the water. The wax capacity equals 0.85 times the weight of water. Take this container, for example. Stop pouring water as soon as it reaches the height needed for the candle. The weight goes up by 120 grams. Multiply that by 0.85, and you get the wax capacity of this container. The second container has a water capacity of 170 grams. This one has a water capacity of 240 grams. The total weight of water is 530 grams multiply that by 0.85. So, I need 450 grams of wax in total. I follow a formula when mixing these waxes. Consider adjusting the ratio based on the season. As transparent containers and candle dye are involved, I add butter wax and soft wax. If no transparent containers and candle dye are involved, which means you're pouring plain white wax into opaque containers, you only need soy wax. It can be regular soy wax or imported soy wax, such as Golden Brands 464 Soy Wax and Cargill's Nature Wax C3 Soy Wax. By the way, white wax is a perfect match for a white container. No other wax is required in this circumstance. But I'm going to pour colored wax into this transparent container. That's why butter wax and soft wax are added. Remember, change the ratio as needed. We've entrusted the factory to produce a kind of container candle wax according to the formula. Those who don't want to mix soy wax with other ingredients can use that formula wax instead. That formula has proven to be more stable and its user is the least likely to have adhesion problems and white spots. You can heat the wax on an 800 watt wax heater with only two heat settings, i.e. high heat and low heat. I set the wax heater to low heat. And the thermal board is still as high as about 200 degrees Celsius. Hence, don't leave the wax heater on unattended. Keep an eye on the melting wax. Stop heating the soy wax when its temperature goes up to 100 degrees Celsius. Otherwise, the soy wax can easily develop a yellow tint, thereby spoiling the appearance of the candle. This won't be a problem if you intend to color the soy wax. 
so, the wax temperature can be slightly higher than necessary. Just wait until it drops to the optimal temperature. Then, pour the wax into a container. Those making white candles, however, should watch over the melting wax in case it becomes overheated. Once the wax is almost completely melted, turn off the wax heater. Let the residual heat melt every last bit of it. The pouring temperature will vary according to the wax. Different wax has different pouring temperatures, which is also a crucial element of the final product. There may be holes on the surface if the pouring temperature is too high. If the candle consists solely of soy wax, the pouring temperature should be 57 degrees Celsius. But the candles I'm making today consist of soft micro wax, solidifying at a slightly higher temperature. Therefore, I'll pour the wax mixture into containers at 60 degrees Celsius. Now, let me discuss candle wicks. The most common type is wax free and soft, it's made of pure cotton. Waxed candle wicks are harder than wax-free ones. So, the latter will bend down when you put it into a container candle. You'd better use the waxed wicks when making container candles. It's much easier to shape a hard candle wick. Many prefer coiling the long upper end of a candle wick when making a glass candle. We also find waxed wicks easier to light up. Another candle wick is made of natural twine and coated with natural beeswax. Even though this wick is a bit softer than an ordinary waxed wick, it can also stand. The combination of natural twine and natural beeswax proves to be better for your health too. Moreover, this waxed twine burns more efficiently. As far as ordinary waxed wicks are concerned, carbon will build up faster, causing the wicks to curl at their tips. That's why you should trim these wicks frequently. The twine wicks, on the other hand, won't curl at their tips. You don't need to trim them as often. They burn more efficiently. The third kind is wooden candle wicks. They usually come with their bases. Stick a wooden wick into a base and then place the base at the bottom of a container. There'll be a crackling sound once you light a wooden candle wick. It's quite an ambience. A candle will offer a distinctive aesthetic thanks to the wooden wick. If you like the wooden wick, get it into a candle base and stick it to the bottom of a container. Waxed wicks usually come with candle bases. If not, you can put it into a metal base and then clamp them together by yourself. Please clamp the upper part so that the metal base won't warp. Aside from fixing the wick to the container, the candle base is a flame retardant. The candle base will extinguish the flame when the candle burns all the way down. Then, there'll be no damage to the container. Stick the candle base to the container bottom with double-sided tape. We won't pour really hot liquid into candle containers. So, the double-sided tape will have no problem holding everything together. But if you pour incredibly hot wax into a container, the double-sided tape may be degummed and the candle base floats around in the liquid wax. As for candle wicks, the number of plies should vary with the size and shape of the container. If your container has a long neck or a narrow mouth, decrease your wick size. Such a container makes it more difficult for the heat to escape which helps widen the melt pool. In comparison, a cylinder container is less likely to achieve a full melt pool. So, don't fill the container up with wax. Be sure to leave a little space at the top of the container. When you light the candle, the container will hold the heat. Then, the entire candle will feel the warmth, thus favoring the formation of the melt pool. If there is too much wax in the container, the heat will be dissipated into the air immediately instead of being transferred to the container. Consequently, the candle will fail to melt all the way to the edge. Whenever you make a container candle, the first thing to do is to find a container with a narrow mouth. The other alternative is to leave a little bit of room on top of the container. The container will only warm up if the candle is burning inside. This will allow a full melt pool to form. This works basically like candle toppers. Candle toppers are often sold with candles. Let a candle topper sit on top of a container. Then the heat will radiate over the container, allowing a full melt pool to form. When it comes to a wide candle, it's a good idea to put two or three wicks into a container candle. Don't use a single wick. Otherwise, there's a risk of candle tunneling. Due to a large wick, the candle flame is too high. This not only produces smoke, but also looks awful. If your container candle has a diameter larger than 8 or 9 centimeters, I recommend using 2 or 3 wicks to achieve the best burn. 
you don't need double-sided tape to hold candle wicks in place. Another approach is to pour a little liquid wax into a container. Then, put candle wicks on the bottom and secure them with disposable chopsticks. The solidified wax will hold the wicks in place. With two or three wicks, a candle with a wide diameter can burn properly. Melt the soy wax completely. Be sure not to heat the wax over 100 degrees Celsius. If you don't want to change the wax color, remove the heat source when the wax temperature rises to 70 degrees Celsius. I'm making three different candles today. Only one of them will be colored. What I need to do is to pour that portion out. Now, let me make a candle that retains the wax color. So, I can skip coloring and add essential oil only. Mix it in and pour the mixture into a container. Let me measure the wax temperature. It's only when the temperature is right that essential oil can be added. The essential oil will not mix well with cool liquid wax. Such candles are susceptible to curdling. When added to hot liquid wax, however, essential oil evaporates easily. This will reduce the fragrance load. To make container candles, I recommend adding essential oil to melted wax at 70 to 75 degrees Celsius. This will help mix the essential oil and retain much of the fragrance. The ideal ratio of essential oil to wax is 5 to 10 percent. Use a measuring spoon to add the right amount of essential oil. To me, the 7.5 milliliters measuring spoon is the most useful one. I add one spoon for 100 grams of wax. Calculate the amount of essential oil needed in this ratio. I added two spoons for almost 200 grams of wax. You must stir the mixture thoroughly. An uneven distribution of essential oil will create a rough surface. After the essential oil evenly disperses throughout the wax, let the mixture cool off. Then, pour it into a container once the mixture reaches 60 degrees Celsius. The mixture, which consists of soy wax, butter wax, and soft wax, is usually ready to pour when the wax temperature is between 60 and 65 degrees Celsius. If there's a wooden wick in the container, let the soy wax run down this wick. First, the wick can direct the flow of the liquid, which reduces the bubbles. Second, the wax will coat the wooden wick, which ensures proper combustion. While the wax is set up, don't disturb the container, because doing so will make the candle top wrinkly. Let me pour the wax into this goblet. Then, secure the wick. A wooden wick can stay where it is. It doesn't need to be held in place. Other waxed wicks tend to lean sideways. So, please use disposable chopsticks or wick holders to secure waxed wicks. Let me make the third candle. I want to make a tricolor candle. I tilt the container in the tray. Then, I place a silicone mold beneath the container to support it in position. Secure the wick. Then, pour the first portion into the container. This portion of wax retains its original color. I blend soy wax with essential oil and then pour the mixture between 60 and 65 degrees Celsius. You can preheat the container to reduce the temperature difference between the wax and the container. This can increase the container adhesion up mostly. Please preheat containers or molds before pouring wax into them, especially when the weather is cold. A smaller temperature gap makes the finished candle products better, while a larger one creates holes or causes other imperfections. So, blow hot air over the container before pouring. Center the stirrer to help you direct the flow of the liquid. Then the soy wax won't splash all over the container. The stirrer can also reduce bubbles. This is how you should pour the first portion into the container. During the hardening process, avoid moving the container. Otherwise, the wax will stain the container, thereby spoiling the appearance of the finished candle. Let me pour the first portion into the container. I'll pour the wax into the container three times, one color at a time. Each of the three portions constitutes one-third of the candle. The first portion is white. Don't move the container till the wax is set. Divide the remaining liquid wax into two portions and color them separately. Let me color the wax first. As the first portion hardens, the wax will surely drop to a lower temperature. You can reheat the wax before adding the essential oil. Then, pour the mixture into the container. Today, I want some violet wax and some yellow wax. The candle will be marked by contrasting colors. 
Only non-penetrating candle dye is acceptable because the violet wax will come into contact with the white wax below. Over time, ordinary concentrated candle dye transfers to the adjacent white wax, leaving candles looking undesirable. Let me add violet block dye first. Use a stirrer to scoop the block dye into the wax. Then, agitate the liquid. You can do this while reheating the liquid if it has cooled down. The block dye won't dissolve completely if the liquid is not hot enough. In that case, there'll be small granules on the surface. You'll end up with an unappealing candle. Let me add a tiny bit of yellow block dye to the mixture. Yellow is in stark contrast to violet. These contrasting colors will cancel each other out when combined. Now I have a muted color, which is less intense and less bright. Stir constantly while the mixture is heating up. This will help the block dye dissolve faster. It's worth noting that the temperature shouldn't exceed 100 degrees Celsius. Once the color is uniform throughout, remove the heat source and conduct a color test. Put a drop of colored wax on a whiteboard. As far as candles go, their colors will change drastically once liquid wax solidifies. Therefore, be sure to test the color whenever candle dye is added. Get two drops on a whiteboard and check out their color when they're set. This is a much better indication of what color the finished candle will have. I'll go with this muted violet. Set the wax aside when you get the desired color. I'll reheat the liquid and add essential oil before pouring the mixture into the container. Let me color the last portion of the wax. Its color will be the contrast color of the second portion. This time, I put golden dye into the liquid wax. Desaturate the golden color by mixing it with a small amount of violet and vice versa. Let me put a bit more violet dye to mute the color. The liquid has cooled down. As a result, the dye won't get distributed evenly. So, I stir the mixture as it sits on the wax heater, which speeds up the dissolving process. Remove the mixture from the heat once the dye has uniform dispersion throughout the wax. Stir well and then test the color. Once again, add a drop on the whiteboard and check out the color when the wax is set. I'll go with this desaturated golden. Set the wax aside when you are satisfied with its color. Don't disturb these three container candles when they're setting up. Then proceed. The wax has solidified for the first time. It has a flat surface. If this container candle is exactly what you want, the making process is over. Trim the candle wick to its optimum length. The candle wick shouldn't be too long. It should be 3 to 5 millimeters above the surface. To decorate the surface, we can blow the candle's surface with a heat gun before putting the decorative elements on the top. This is a ready-made polar bear. Watch my video about pillar candles, and you'll know how to make a polar bear. All you need to do is to follow the formula for pillar candles. Afterward, put the polar bear on top of the candle. Melt the wax on the surface. Put the polar bear on top and don't move it. The bear will stick firmly to the candle when the wax solidifies. This is one way to do it. The other way is to leave a little wax and pour it to make a thin layer on the surface. Remove the disposable chopsticks. Pour a little on top of the candle. Use liquid wax to stick decorative elements to the candle. For example, I want to decorate a container candle with white hydrangea. Please pay attention that dry flower decorations are not suitable for burning. When they encounter a flame, there's a risk of catching fire. A wide container candle can be decorated with dried flowers, which should be far away from the candle wick. Or you can use this container wax as a room fragrance spreading. You'd better not light it up. But if your customers plan to do so, please tell them to remove the dried flowers and flammable decorative elements in advance to prevent them from catching fire or other safety incidents. If you want a crescent-shaped decoration on one side of the candle, put the candle wick on the opposite side, that is, as far away from your decoration as possible. If you want the decoration like a wreath on the candle, the dried flowers should face outward. So, you should arrange your design in advance, before making the candles. The general principle is to keep the dried flowers away from the flame. Those who aren't good at coloring should use fewer colors. You can use the same color or similar colors.
To make an autumn-themed candle, I put two leaves in the midst. The decorative elements shouldn't come in too many colors. Then wait until the wax is set. The wax in this container is solidified. Change the container to the other direction. Just turn it 180 degrees. Reheat the colored wax. Then add the essential oil. Agitate the mixture thoroughly. Place a spoon vertically and let the essential oil run down along the spoon. This way, the liquid will not splash, rush to the inner surface, or create too many bubbles. I tilted the container a bit low just now. So, I changed the angle. As a result, there's a wax mark on the inner wall of the container. Let me blow it with the heat gun. Set the heat gun at a low speed. You can wipe off the wax marks with a paper towel. Wait until the liquid wax is set. Afterward, leave the container upright on the table. Mix the yellow candle dye and then add the essential oil. Agitate the mixture thoroughly. The pouring temperature is 65 degrees Celsius. Pour the mixture into the mold at the right temperature. You can let the mixture run down this spoon. This will reduce the bubbles and prevent the wax from splashing. This layer of wax shouldn't be too high. The surface can be flush with the highest edge of the purple wax. It looks better this way. Then, put the container aside. Wait until the wax is set. Look at the container candle with dried flowers. If you find the solidified surface uneven, blow it with a heat gun. Don't blow hot air over the surface continuously. Turn the heat gun on and off frequently. Set the heat gun at a low speed. Melt the uneven parts. Then let the wax solidify again. Next, take the disposable chopsticks away after it solidifies completely. Cut the candle wick down to about 1 cm above the surface. For this candle in the middle, you can have a slightly longer candle wick. But you need to coil it for a shape. If the candle is for sale, please inform your customer that before lighting up the candle, the candle wick should be cut down to the range of 0.8 to 1 cm above the surface. The wooden wick should be cut down to the range of 5 to 8 mm above the surface. It can't be too long, or it'll be hard to light up the wax. It's better to use candles with dried flowers as a flameless room fragrance or wax melts. The soy wax will extend a nice, soothing fragrance to your space at normal temperature. Its smell is good. If you light up the candle wick, the dried flowers will likely catch fire. So, this is a defective product if it's meant to be lit up. If you want to light up a candle with dried flowers, the candle wick can't be placed in the center. If you want a crescent-shaped decoration on one side of the candle like ours, put a candle wick on the other side. That is, you need to finalize the design before putting the candle wick in place. You can put the candle wick near the edge. Keep the dried flowers away from the candle wick. Install the candle wick at the far end. Then it will be safer when it burns. Furthermore, the candle wick shouldn't be too thick. A thick candle wick doesn't necessarily bring the flame to the edge but it does strengthen the flame. In that case, any airflow may lead to a flickering flame. For example, the candle flickers simply because people walk around. As a result, the dried flowers on the edge may be ignited by the flickering flame or burn black, which is no good. Well, this is how to make basic cup candles. Please choose the formula and wax materials that are suitable for you. Hi, I'm Jade. This is a QA episode for candle making. 
It's mainly about container candles, or more specifically, candle jars. Every candle maker should know how to make candle jars, because they're fundamental to so many candle designs. But you may encounter many problems when making it. During this QA episode, aside from taking you through key steps of the making process, I'll address issues arising from different formulas or temperatures so that you can determine what the best course of action is. Let me discuss the materials. Soy wax is a staple material of container candles. The soy wax melting point below 52 degrees Celsius is called container candle wax because it won't hold its shape without a mold. This soy wax is made especially for container candles. The most common soy waxes available come from China and abroad. The ones made in China melt at 52 degrees Celsius. They're cost-effective and easy to buy. I like using them during demonstrations because they cost less. Other soy waxes are imported from the US. The most popular ones are Golden Brands 464 Soy Wax and Cargill's Nature Wax C3 Soy Wax. Both waxes, which melt between 49 and 51 degrees Celsius, are an ideal choice for container candles. Some other soy waxes consist of additives. If they're colored with candle dye, the candle will look frosty like this. Imported soy waxes can help fix this problem. You can use them to make more consistent candles. Say two container candles are made in the same place at the same temperature. The one made of imported soy waxes may have fewer problems. This doesn't mean imported soy waxes can keep all problems at bay. After all, soy wax is very sensitive. Even with imported soy wax, there's no guarantee that adhesion issues, white spots, or oily surfaces will never show up. So I suggest adding additives or other natural waxes to reduce the likelihood of these problems occurring. As far as scents are concerned, Chinese soy wax has a strong odor of soy milk. So you don't have to add essential oil to domestic soy wax, which leaves container soy candles enveloped in the scent of natural soy milk. Essential oil is used to enhance a specific aroma. Imported soy waxes have a gentle, soothing flavor. So pick the soy wax you like. Imported soy waxes may not be way better than their Chinese counterparts. You can tackle potential issues by adding other waxes. This is a brief introduction to soy wax. Now, let me cover the most common problems of soy wax. The first problem is frosting. Look at the frost-like crystals formed on the sides of this candle. The frosting is even more noticeable on this one. The soy wax has shrunk and crystallized. White soy candles make the white crystallization patches unnoticeable. So, it doesn't matter whether plain colored soy candles frost or not. Frosting will be problematic for colored soy wax. Imported soy wax can reduce the crystal formations, while domestic soy wax is more susceptible to frosting. If you opt to use color, be prepared to blend it with other substances to reduce frosting. This problem can be fixed by adding beeswax or soft micro wax, aka soft wax. But container candles shrink considerably due to the beeswax. When the shrinkage is strengthened, the container candles will have a more serious adhesion issue. It's possible that the candles can drop out in their entirety when the glasses are turned upside down. This candle contains beeswax. You can see half the candle doesn't adhere to the glassware because of the shrinkage. Sometimes, the candle can be completely separated from the walls of the glassware. This actually looks better than when half the candle separates from the glassware because the adhesion issue is more apparent in the latter case. You can add the beeswax to stop the frosting. The glassware is usually labeled. Some of you prefer big labels that hide the white spots. Look at the place where the wax separates from the glassware and the place where it doesn't. As long as you cover the boundary with a label, the white spots will be barely discernible. So you can add approximately 5% beeswax to prevent frosting from happening. If the candle container is opaque, you can reduce frosting by adding a bit of white beeswax because white spots are no longer an issue. Just like the beeswax, soft wax can discourage the soy wax from frosting. Moreover, soft wax doesn't contribute to glass adhesion issues. This candle made partially from soft wax adheres to the sides of the glassware just fine. It was made over half a month ago. This is a great formula. Given the transparent candle container, you'd be better off adding soft wax. But the quality of soft wax is inconsistent. You can't rule out the white spots by simply adding soft wax. 
these two candles were made in the same conditions. Only one of them develops white spots. This one contains soft wax as well as essential oil. The other one also contains soft wax, but there are a few white spots. This is due to the making process. There's no surefire formula to fix these problems. It's perfectly normal that you don't get the same finished products in another season, even if the making process is unchanged. Trial and error are the only ways you can refine the making process. Adhesion issues, as mentioned, are the second problem. Look at this. Much of the candle has pulled away from the glassware. It's not pleasing to the eye at all. Adhesion issues are one of the most common problems of soy candles. Very few soy candles are immune to white spots. Look, I followed the same formula when making this candle. It looks perfect. The wax doesn't frost or pull away from the glassware. The candle top is smooth too. The formula remained unchanged. I used this formula again to make another container candle but set it in a freezer. This is what I end up with, a glass candle with cracks. So, formulas aren't foolproof. This is because soy wax is sensitive to fluctuations in temperature. Keep learning from your mistakes. This is the best you can do. To fix the adhesion issues, you can add the wax that melts at a lower temperature or sticks better to the glassware. My choice of additive is butter wax. This is what its package looks like. I actually asked the factory to pack the butter wax in boxes. This wax will get oily in a plastic bag. It's just too much trouble to take the butter wax in or out of a plastic bag. So, the butter wax is put into a box at my request. Look at the state of the butter wax. It's late summer now. The hot weather lingers on. The butter wax is soft at room temperature. You can practice piping with this wax. The hotter the weather is, the softer the butter wax will be. Adjust the ratio in light of your needs. Butter wax should account for approximately 5% in summer. The proportion should rise to the range between 20 and 30% in winter. Change the proportion as needed. You can add butter wax and a little soft micro wax to reduce the frosting and the adhesion issues. This was exactly the formula I used when making this container candle. It has been great so far. I made this candle almost a month ago. It was a successful trial. In the scorching heat of summer, you'll see a little bit of oil floating on the candle's surface. So, I suggest reducing the proportion of essential oil to accommodate the addition of butter wax. Otherwise, more oil will be leaking out of the wax. These two problems are fairly common. The next problem should be fixed during the making process. For example, the candle top is uneven. There is a sinkhole on the surface. What should you do? This is another example, it has a sinkhole too. This problem has two solutions. The first one is to remelt the surface with a heat gun. Pour over the candle top with enough of a layer and allow the wax to reset, creating a smooth top. But no one knows the size of the sinkhole. So, you may find the candle top sinks slightly after the refill. It may take multiple passes to smooth out the finish completely. The other solution should be adopted when the wax starts to harden. The wax will become too hard if you don't adopt the second solution soon enough. Poke the sinkhole with a stirrer or a thermometer a few times to expose the hole completely. You can do a second pour when the bottom of the sinkhole is fully exposed. You can set aside leftover wax for the refill. To smooth out the surface, either re-pour additional melted wax on the candle top or remelt the surface with a heat gun. Both solutions work. Fill the sinkhole of this candle in the same manner. Gently heat the surface of the wax with a heat gun until it is completely level again. You can reheat the surface too if a substantial amount of oil separated from the wax has risen to the surface. Look. A sinkhole is found close to the candle wick when I remelt the surface. The sinkhole is hidden until I remelt the surface. So, you have to poke the sinkhole several times, regardless of how tiny the sinkhole is. After all trapped air bubbles are dispersed, remelt the surface or do a second pour to create a smooth candle top. For those who are bothered by rough tops, sinkholes, or other aesthetic issues, 
It's a good rule of thumb that you remelt the candle surface or re-pour just enough wax on top to smooth out the surface. Then the candle top can reset to a smooth finish. Look at this candle top. Well, the pitted finish kind of reminds me of holes in a fermented cake. This results from essential oil overload. The essential oil isn't incorporated into the soy wax fully. And you end up with a pitted surface like okara. This requires you to stir consistently for at least 30 seconds to mix the essential oil in. Adding your essential oil to the wax at low temperatures can keep the essential oil from being incorporated fully. Don't do that. So, pour at a slightly higher temperature. Everybody can agree that essential oil shouldn't be added to overheated wax. Otherwise, the essential oil will evaporate, weakening the scent throw. This means your essential oil should be added at a proper temperature. You can add it when your wax is at, say, 75 degrees Celsius. This will help the essential oil bind to the wax properly, which will help give you the strongest scent throw. This is an obstacle you may stumble into during the candle making session. I've gone on and on about different problems and their solutions. It's apparent that the majority of the issues are associated with temperatures. It's only natural that temperature control is critical to candle making. If candles are being made in an exceptionally cold room, 2 or 3 degrees Celsius, the problems can't be helped even with the best formula or the wax of the highest quality. So, I recommend constant temperature cabinets for waxes to anyone who makes conchner candles frequently or who has orders to fill them all the time. This is a compact size constant temperature cabinet for wax. Those who are swamped with orders may need full-size constant temperature cabinets. What's a constant temperature cabinet anyway? This equipment is designed to maintain a constant ambient temperature for the hardening wax. So, the constant temperature cabinet provides the ideal conditions for the hardening wax to improve glass adhesion. Here are the operating instructions, open the glass door and leave a thermometer inside. A word of caution, don't rely on the temperature control knob because it seldom helps you reach the set temperature. Instead, look at the thermometer in the cabinet. It's ideal for the hardening wax if the temperature readings are somewhere between 26 and 28 degrees Celsius. So, check the ambient temperatures in the cabinet. Each unit of equipment is unique. After you bring the equipment home, turn the temperature control knob. Once the temperature readings fall between 25 and 28 degrees Celsius, note the current setting. Use the same setting whenever you leave the hardening wax in this equipment. Constant temperature cabinets are useful in cold weather, especially in fall and winter. Use the equipment to harden the wax, and you won't encounter most of these issues. Thank you so much for taking this course with me. I hope you now realize that making candles is not as intimidating as it seems. We just need to create each part of the candle step by step using the features of pillar and container candles that we learned in this course. As the next step, I recommend learning our Candle Boost program from the link below. It provides the related hands-on projects for all theories we learned in this course. For example, we will make 10 different candle accessories, like berries and cookies together after the candle mold lesson. We'll make beeswax flower candles after we learned the beeswax. Also, the Boost program covers at least one course from our 10 themed candle series for you to trail. You'll make baking cake candles, macaron dessert candles, ice cream and drink candles, fruit candles, beeswax flower candles, pipping flower candles, crystal candles, leather candles, holiday candles, last but not least, creative art candles. Again, thank you very much for watching. My name is Jade Fan, the founder of the Fun Candles. I want to make candle making easier for everyone. If you have any comments, questions, or feedback, please leave them down in the comments section below. If you want to support this channel and you want more courses like this, please click the subscribe button. Thank you so much, and I will see you in the next one.